Hey everybody, my name is Perry, and I'm sitting in an 11 foot by 36 foot garage in San Diego, California, where since late October 2021, 11 months now, I've been building a 14 foot mini cruiser sailboat. I'm building her strong and watertight, specifically for long offshore passages. She features twin keels, a scow bow, and a Jungstrom rig, which means the whole mast is freestanding and spins to furl the sail. If you're new here, this is the perfect place to begin because I'm going to discuss my plans for the boat build, including all the unique aspects of the design that make it ocean capable. This boat is 14 feet long with a six foot beam. Every design decision is made to keep her simple, strong, and watertight. You won't find any Bluetooth connected toilets, combustion engines, water heaters, or any other unnecessary luxuries in this boat. It's a minimalist, tough mini cruiser that can be stored in a garage, but can also take me to any port in the world I want to go. And the best part is I don't have to suffer the big boat expenses and hassles to do it. Now I get asked a lot, why don't I build a bigger boat? And wouldn't that be much safer in the harsh ocean conditions? To which I say nonsense. For 80 years, the average size of a private yacht has gone up and up. And people will now tell you that you need some 40 plus foot boat if you want to even think about going offshore. Of course, anyone who made their paycheck selling boats or associated marine parts or services has been promoting this idea. And they've been successful at it for decades. Here's why it's a big lie born out of consumerism. Smaller structures are inherently strong. This is due to the squared cubed law. Basically, the stresses on an object grow much faster than the strength as you increase its size. Double the size gives half the strength. Three times the size gives a third the strength. And so on. This is why small animals like cats and mice can jump from a second story window and scamper away unharmed. But not so for the unfortunate cow or horse. A 14 foot hull can endure higher forces than a 40 foot hull. And because it presents less surface area to the wind and waves, a smaller boat doesn't encounter as harsh forces as a larger boat will. And I know what some might say, small boats are uncomfortable and I need more space because my comfort is important to me. And sure, a small boat might occasionally be uncomfortable, but what adventure in life ever came from a place of great comfort? It feels nice to be comfortable temporarily, but comfort is boring. It robs us of challenges and memorable experiences. It makes us lazy and unhealthy. And what are we really doing here? Because if traveling in comfort is really your priority, then an airline ticket would serve you much better than a sailboat would. And as for running aground, look what it did to Bernard Montessier's Joshua, Bob Griffith's Awahani, Laura Decker's Guppy, or Team Vesta's Volvo Ocean Racer. The larger and heavier your boat, the greater the damage when you hit something, whether it's another boat or a reef. And the more likely she's a total loss after a grounding. Whereas a lighter boat with a strong bottom can be moved back to deep water using simple techniques. I could keep going on to cap sizes and dismastings, but just check out episode two or six if you want to hear more about that. My boat is constructed of PVC foam core between fiberglass skins. This is the foam sandwich construction method. I chose a foam core because it's lightweight, it's a closed cell foam so it's buoyant and water absorption is negligible, and it doesn't rot or fall apart like plywood will in time. This foam is used in the construction of everything from boat hulls and surfboards to industrial water tanks and wind turbine blades. The weight is only four pounds per cubic foot. Compare that to marine ply at a whopping 37 pounds per cubic foot. Back aft, there is no footwell or cockpit, just an aft deck, which is reduced in size to only about three and a half feet long. Footwells have the potential to fill with water, which slowly drains. This can increase your chance of capsizing when hit by a big wave and increase the time it takes to right after a knockover. Having a smaller, flat aft deck allows the boat to quickly shed any water that washes on deck. The boat is designed to be self-riding in all conditions. Many people focus only on how deep is your keel, how heavy is your ballast. They forget that there are other allies in the fight for stability. These allies are buoyancy and hull shape. Using buoyancy and hull shape to build a self-riding boat is smarter, cheaper, lighter, and easier to build. With the right hull shape, 
you could have a self-riding boat in all conditions with no keel or lead ballast at all. Just your gear and water secured low in the boat. That's exactly what the rowboats that go across the oceans do. I use these tactics on my boat in the following ways. The beam is similar to the height. Food, water, and other heavy items are secured low in the bilge with locking hatches and tie downs. The deck is curved and uncluttered. There's a doghouse in the center and a flotation arch on the stern. If the boat capsizes and begins to invert, these become large volumes of air submerged in the water, applying more riding moment to the boat the closer it gets to fully inverted. Add to this the lead ballast secured to the bottom of twin keels, and you have a boat that is highly unstable when inverted. She will quickly return to her upright position if knocked over. She also has multiple flotation chambers in the bow, stern, and amidships, filled with closed plastic bottles. This is another great safety feature, because in the unlikely event that the boat fills with water, these compartments will keep her floating until emergency repairs and bailing can be completed. I plan to use trim tab self-steering. The big advantage to me is the pure simplicity of it. Whenever the boat strays off course, the vane turns the trim tab on the trailing end of the rudder, and the water flow acting upon it pushes the rudder blade over to return the boat on course. Bernard Moitessier gave trim tab self-steering the only review I need in his book, The Long Way, when he wrote that in 10 months at sea, he only hand steered for about 10 hours when coming close to land and when his wind vane broke in a storm. I'm confident this simple trim tab system will be a devoted helmsman for many sea miles for me as well. My boat features a round hatch I'll build here in the shop to be watertight through rainfall, breaking waves, and even rollovers. I've never understood why sailboats still use the sliding horizontal main companionway hatch with those wood slats you slide down vertically into place. If you read enough sailing books, you'll notice a common occurrence is a waterfall of water coming into the cabin during a capsize, rollover, or when water breaks on deck. These hatches are built for cocktail hour at the dock, not serious ocean sailing. I've added a low-profile doghouse with rounded corners to the deck. It has non-opening port lights, also known as deadlights, which allow for a 360-degree field of view. From an interior seat, I will be able to steer and adjust my sail in the worst of weather while staying warm and dry. Sail adjustments can be made from inside by adjusting the main sheet or the furling line, which enter the doghouse through water-resistant tubes, angled downward to prevent rainwater from entering the cabin. And here you can see my internal tiller system. From the aft end of the rudder, control arms link the rudder to a vertical shaft descending through a watertight shaft housing in the aft deck. From here, it's connected to the internal tiller located in the cargo hold. Internal control lines, indicated in green here, run through blocks and allow me to steer from the cabin. Through hulls and other holes below the waterline are eliminated from this boat, and opening hatches are minimized to only the main hatch to eliminate water from entering the cabin as much as possible. There will be ventilation cowls located forward and aft with a special design to prevent water from entering even through a rollover. The idea is to have this boat like a tightly sealed oil drum. Well sealed, a craft like that will endure any storm as long as she's well off from any rocky shore. For anchoring in gentle conditions, I have 100 feet of half-inch nylon anchor road and a 20-pound navy stockless anchor. For when conditions get nastier, I carry 20 feet of 3 8 inch chain and my 22-pound spade anchor. What's your favorite design element of this boat? Let me know in the comments. Want even more details? Check out episode six, where I explain the advantages of the scow bow, the rounded bow I've chosen, or episode seven, where I go in depth on the incredible benefits of twin keels and why I chose those for my boat, or learn all about backing plates and watch me build them in episodes 22 and 24, or watch episode 23, installing the final frame. It's one of my most popular videos. Why? Who knows? Also capable, so boat. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like it and make sure you're subscribed to my channel. Also, please check out my Patreon or buy the stuff for the boat or contribute through PayPal. It's all down there in the description. There's even Instagram and Facebook. So join us over there. Okay, see you next time. Before Dallas make all preparations for getting underway. Hey, yeah. Uh,
Oh, get back to your station, or I'll have you shot through the air. Well, shoot some.